We'll start tonight with the displeased listener section. Uh, this is a repeat displeased listener. I will tell you when there is a period. <clears throat> yep, I myself am a Jew. I have friends who are Greek, and all the Greeks I've spoken to who actually have studied dispensational theology. They are all dispensationalists because when they study dispensational theology, they had no choice but to admit that this been stationary was the way to understand Scripture, because if you don't rightly divide doctrine, there's no point in trying to read the Bible, because you're just going to pervert the basic notion of Scripture. And as a Jew myself, the problem with most Jews is that they're brainwashed. I don't know if you have any integrity in that body of yours, or in that mind of yours, you seem to care about Scripture, but I have caught you many, 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 many times violating biblical integrity while claiming to have integrity. For instance, you monetize your videos. That's not true. When your Apostle Paul tells us that if someone wishes out of a free heart to give to you out of the kindness of their heart, they have the right to do that, but instead you force them to pay you through ads on your videos. Again, that's not true. Also, Paul tells you to work. I do that. He does not tell you to simply live off the Bible. That is not what Paul tells you to do. There is piety in work, but I digress. I have witnessed you telling people that the body of Christ can sin, and I will tell you that if you're a saved person, you still have the capacity to sin, and that there is sin in the body of Christ. That is a complete and total heresy. You are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Your spirit has been circumcised from your flesh. You are not your own. You are bought with a price, the price of Christ's death on the cross. You can send, I think he meant sin, as much as you want in your flesh, not saying you should, I'm proving a point here. As I was saying, you can send sin, I think, as much as you want in the flesh, and it will not be put on to your spirit, because your spirit and flesh are officially separate from each other through the act of circumcision spiritually. Because of this, you can sin as much as you want, and the wages of sin is death, but because of the precious blood of Christ, you will not taste of death. What I mean by death in this context is hell because salvation has already been given the moment you believe the gospel. If you think that the body of Christ is going to be judged for sin when we stand before the judgment seat, you are sadly, sadly mistaken, because it is impossible, absolutely impossible, for sin to be put on the body of Christ. It's literally impossible. Because of the act of Jesus Christ, the fact you would say something like that tells me you're either not thinking it through or you're trying to put people under a perception that they have to watch what they do. You need to watch what you do. I am putting you under that impression, and I'm doing that intentionally. Or else they could be judged for sin, but to switch topics, I, <laughs> I am at this point disillusioned with American Christianity. Most American Christians are not Christian. I have just finished the study that took me over an entire year. This study was I contacted every single religious organization in the entire United States and asked them three simple questions. One of them was, what is the gospel? I have quite literally millions of phone calls and hours and hours and hours of conversations. I have come to the conclusion that modern-day Christianity in the United States is nothing more than a cult designed to create the kind of person that those in power wish for. According to this knowledge, I have determined that modern-day Christianity is nothing more than sorcery designed specifically to control people. Does this mean that Christianity in general is evil? No, I don't believe that at all. I do believe in dispensational theology, don't get me wrong. But modern-day Christianity in the United States as a whole is a wretch. The fact that virtually all dispensational pastors, except for a handful that I have seen, are now turning to putting works on their people tells me either they don't really believe in what they're saying or they're given orders by people to change their doctrine. It's not much of a stretch concerning the fact that the United States is a Masonic country. Being a nation controlled by Freemasonry, its structure is that of male fertility, using the ins and outs as a means of perception, as a means to manipulate those who are unenlightened. 
I do not think all this been stationary pastors are controlled, but I do believe that most of you guys are controlled by money and by how people see you. This is why I have become disillusioned with the concept of mainstream Christianity or the concept of organizing Christians into organizations or into big groups. I think if someone is doing this, they're controlled. But as far as for you, I find you to be a sophist. I have emailed you in the past, and instead of answering my questions, you ran away like a coward. I have questions you on forms made my opinion based on Scripture known, and you did not recant or show that you had any form of integrity to admit that you're human, and therefore you are not perfect. Instead, your ego obviously clouded your understanding of the situation and caused you to ignore what others said. At least that's one way of looking at it. To be honest, I really could care less what you think. Because when I see someone making money off the Bible and not working, when the Bible commands you to work, that tells me all I need to know at that point. I've reached the understanding now to see what I'm looking at. But I will show you kindness. Your videos in the past have given me great insight and knowledge in dispensational theology, as well as understanding of breaking the brainwashing I was under by my Jewish abuse. Helped me a great deal, and I am incredibly grateful for that. But I would do myself a disservice to not hold you accountable by calling you out as well, as I would not be able to have any integrity in myself to simply allow this to go on without voicing my opinion, surely you can understand, period. I will no longer support your channel. I will be unsubscribing. I sincerely hope you go to work <laughs> because every time you try to make a video in order to try to get more views so you can make more money, all you're doing is slowly destroying doctrine or you're controlled one of the two, as I've stated. I really don't care which. I've given up trying to speak with you in private, and I've given up trying to call you out in public. This is just my way of putting it down, period. Goodbye. So, I'm not going to respond to all of that. Um, I'll just say this. We don't intentionally monetize our videos. YouTube controls that. I have no control over that. I don't make any money from that. Um, so... There we are. Um, in case you're wondering if I misquoted that, that is posted on Q66, question 66, so you can look at that for yourself if you want. This one is another displeased listener. Did you notice that God had Ross, and I think that's Brian Ross, answer the question you balked at on Romans 13:12? Oh, but wait, James 1 through 5 doesn't apply to me. But the main thing is that you wrote me off because in your realm I don't belong. My initial question was just too absurd to seriously ponder. Needless to say, humans are being slaughtered as we speak for the sake of Zionism. But due to my uncultured pragmatism, which didn't raise to your level of scholarship, my Romans question was deferred. Then somehow, through coincidence, that's in quotes, Brian brilliantly answered that very detailed question regarding the night is far spent. That was a fumble that cost you great embarrassment. Dare you answer this question? Why are Christians currently endorsing the slaughter of nations? Could it be that Satan is weakening the nations? My first question really wasn't if Jesus was a Jewish. It was about how Zionism hijacks his Jewishness to create a narrative that loving your neighbor is conditional. Didn't Paul say, love worketh no ill to his neighbor? I see now that my sophomoric question, what is a Jew, was simply beneath you. Go ahead and block me and prove to everyone of my subhumanness in your eyes and your peculiar silence on the matter. So, I went back to try to find the previous comments, and I can't find them. I think he deleted them, but or someone did. I don't know. I don't think I deleted them, but I can't find them. But what appears to have happened is someone asked me, how I understood Romans 13, 12, 
And I replied with how I understood Romans 13.12, but I think he didn't like the answer. And then Brian Ross addressed Romans 13.12 during the conference. And I guess that from this comment that that was God like rebuking me because Brian explained what Romans 13.12 didn't. And I, I don't know. What, what I, I don't know. Get with me, Matthew 12, 36. I don't believe I de- deleted his prior comments, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. You, YouTube is kind of quirky sometimes, uh, but I don't think I did. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll just quote this, and then if you look at Matthew chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 36, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now, if that verse is true, then we give account for what? Every idle word that we've spoken, and that includes YouTube comments and emails and all the rest. So that would be my observation about that. One other thing does occur to me. I believe this person wrote me a question, and I think the question was, how would you respond uh, to someone saying that those in Israel are not Jews. And they, the way I took the question was, their argument was that those people in Israel that claim to be Jews are not actually Jews. And my response to that was, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. And it, it, I, don't, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it's just not a, I don't think it's a reasonable position. So in any event, that's, that's that is, please, listener. Okay, so one more thing before we move on. I am looking for feedback on the following. I've had a number of folks suggest to me not to read the crazy comments that I get. Um, So, we're not going to do it as majority vote because we're not going to do it that way. Um, Get with me Proverbs 26, verse 4. Proverbs 26, verse 4. <clears throat> Proverbs 26 has, has some interesting things here. Proverbs 26, verse 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. So that says answer not a fool according to his folly. Verse 5. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So one verse says, answer not a fool. The other says, to answer a fool. And you can see there's different circumstances at the end of the verse. So I'm interested, if if people want to provide comments by email or otherwise, or on the video or so on, um, I'm interested in input as to whether I should uh, read those or not. I will say this. One of the reasons I have read some of them is some of the comments are along the following lines. You know, critique, 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 critique. And then something along the lines of, I've rebuked you so bad, you will delete this comment because, like, you know, I'm just in shame. My my argument has been destroyed, and so I'll delete the comment. Now, maybe I shouldn't think about it this way, but when people do stuff like that, it's like, well, no, I'm going to post the comment. I'm going to read the comment because the comment that you think is so outstanding, I'm not convinced it's that great, and I don't want you to have the view that, yeah, I had to delete your comment or I ignored it because it was so great uh, because that's just kind of self-flattery in my view. So in any event, if you have thoughts, and I'm particularly interested in the rationale as to whether we keep doing some of these or not, you can reach out to me and let me know. All right. On to the main event. Go with me Romans chapter 115. Romans chapter 115. The question is, does Romans 1 15 teach that Paul wasn't writing to the body of Christ? Does Romans 1.15 teach that Paul wasn't writing to the body of Christ? So, let's look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 15. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to, the, to you that are Rome also. To you that are at Rome also. And I think the argument that's being raised here is, well... 
if Paul's ready to preach the gospel to those at Rome, then they must not be saved because they need to have the gospel preached to them. The questioner follows up by saying, would your conclusion be from reading this verse that Paul wasn't writing to the body of Christ, but rather to another group of people that have yet to hear his gospel? So, here's my thoughts on this. Paul is clearly the apostle of the Gentiles. Romans 11.13 tells you that. Paul was clearly given the revelation of the mystery. You know that from places like Ephesians 3. Paul's epistles are addressed to the body of Christ. That's who he writes to. My observation is this. In recent years, there has been a fascination with trying to undermine Paul's authority or limit the application of his epistles. So what do I mean by that? There are some that will teach Paul wrote to the little flock, even while he himself says he's the apostle of the Gentiles. Or some will say that portions of Paul's letters are written to the little flock. Other times people will say that portions of Paul's letters are written to the Jews, and thus they're inapplicable to the body of Christ. This question asks if Romans isn't written to save people, if it's written to lost people. There's a common denominator in all of those arguments. What all of those do is that if you believe them, if you believe that Paul's epistles or portions of them are written to the little flock, or written to Jews, or written to lost people, all of those are a rationale for taking Paul's epistles and then saying, this doesn't apply. Okay? That sentiment is common. I think it is extreme, and I think it is simply wrong. So, look with me again at Romans 1.15. Romans chapter 1 and verse 15. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And so the argument is Paul wants to preach the gospel to those in Rome, so therefore they must be lost if they need to hear the preaching of the gospel. Well, let me ask you this question. Would Paul write an epistle with 16 chapters of doctrinal instruction to someone who is lost? Get with me, we're coming back to Romans, but get 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11. Have, if you're trying to witness to someone that is lost, should you write them a hundred pages of explaining doctrine to them? Look at me at 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11. 1 Corinthians 2, 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now you know what that ver those verses are saying? Can a lost man comprehend spiritual truth? He has zero ability to do that. If you take the wisest, most educated, lost people on earth, how much spiritual truth do they understand? They don't understand any by definition because what is necessary to comprehend the things of God? You have to have the Holy Spirit. So if you say that Paul's writing to lost people, does it make sense to send 16 chapters of doctrine to lost people. It's totally pointless to do that. Now, I'm going to show you, as you know, this is all about advanced Bible study. So, go to Romans 1. I'm going to show you a trick. 
Can anyone guess what trick I'm going to show you? It's going to be read the context. So Romans 1.15. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. So if you want to say that's to lost people, look at verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be what? Who does Paul think he's writing to? Saints. You say, well, it just says they're called to be saints. It doesn't say they're saints. Read verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your what? Faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Does Paul think he's writing to saved people or lost people? He thinks he's writing to saved people. Verse 12. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Is there any question at all that Paul thinks he's writing to save people? He thinks they're people of mutual faith with him. Does Paul think he's saved? He does. So then what does Romans 1.15 mean? Well, let's read it one more time. So as much as in me is... I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. That are you at that, that to you that are at Rome also. So let me ask you this: Shouldn't a preacher preach the gospel to saved people? He should. Look with me at get First Timothy chapter four and verse six. It is my hope that the vast majority of our congregation is saved. In fact, it's my hope that 100% of our congregation is saved. I still preach the gospel frequently. Why do I do that? There might be someone there who is a visitor, or there might be someone else who is lost. And if I could say this, it's because we're commanded to put Saints in remembrance of what is true. So look at me at 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things. See, what Paul says to Timothy is he doesn't say to Timothy, well, Timothy, what you have to do is every week you have to come up with something new because people can't stand to hear the same thing twice. It's the opposite of that. You should continually ground people in what is true, including the gospel. Get with me 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So he's declaring unto them the, the gospel. And by the way, this is in chapter 15. Which I preached unto you. So he preached it to them when he was physically present with them. Which also ye have received. So they've already heard this and received it, and yet he's preaching it to them. And wherein ye stand. Now notice verse 2. By which also ye are saved. Now notice this. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So he previously taught them the gospel. He says here that they need to keep it in memory. Now, let me just explain, explain a little bit about verse 2. You see where it says, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you? Here's what he's not saying. He is not saying, if you forget the gospel... God takes away your salvation from hell. If that was the case, what happens if you get like a head injury or amnesia or something like that? He's not saying that your eternal salvation from hell is based upon your continued understanding of the gospel. What he's saying in that passage about if you keep in memory, what happens if you as a believer in your walk. You forget about the gospel, and as discussed extensively in 1 Corinthians 15, 
you forget about the resurrection. What will happen in your life if you forget what you know about the gospel and the resurrection and you focus your attention, your affections, on earthly things? You will be, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, miserable. Because if you forget about the resurrection, if you forget about the gospel, if you forget about the next life, and this is it, well, this ain't much. Right? So what's going on here when he talks about if you keep in memory, he's intentionally reminding them of the gospel in chapter 15, which he previously preached to them, which they previously received. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He's repeating to them the very gospel in those verses that he previously preached to them. So here's the point. There is nothing at all wrong with preaching the gospel again and again and again. And in fact, Paul specifically tells Timothy to do things to keep, the, to put them in in remembrance. So in Romans, is Paul writing to lost people and writing 16 chapters of doctrine to lost people that there is no possible way that a lost person could understand? No. He's writing to save people. Next question. Many teach that Paul took collections for the kingdom saints because they sold all they had And the kingdom didn't come because the Jews rejected the gospel. I find it hard to believe God stopped taking care of them. If he did, why would they sell all that they have during the tribulation based on this? Who knows if there is another interruption in their program, another mystery. Do we really know for sure that Paul wasn't concerned about all poor churches and not specifically the kingdom saints who sold all they had. So there's a couple things there. Let's unpack this. Quote, Many teach that Paul took collections for the kingdom saints because they sold all they had and the kingdom didn't come because the Jews rejected the gospel. That reasoning is wrong. That's incorrect. The kingdom wasn't going to come. So think about this with me. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter stands up and says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, he describes it as what period of time? The last days. And he quotes from Joel, and, and what does Joel say is going to happen? The sun shall be turned to darkness the moon to blood before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Is that a prophecy about Jesus Christ establishes the kingdom? Or is that a prophecy that what the saints in Acts 2 were going to have to endure is the events leading up to the 70th week, and then the 70th week, and then the second coming, and then the establishment of the kingdom? In Acts 2, neither Peter nor anyone else is saying the kingdom's going to come and you don't have to worry about the 70th week. None of them are saying that. Now just think with me for a minute. In Daniel 9, when Daniel writes the prophecy of the 70 weeks, and those have to be fulfilled, was anyone in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John or Acts saying, you can get the kingdom now and you don't have to go through the 70th week. No one said that and they couldn't have said that because if that is true, then Daniel 9 is wrong. So hopefully, hopefully you get that. So I'm going to read the statement again. Many teach that Paul took collections for the kingdom saints He did take collections for the kingdom saints because they sold all they had, yes, and the kingdom didn't come because the Jews rejected the gospel. No, that's not what's going on. What's going on is this. If there was no dispensation of grace, 
So assume no dispensation of grace. What would have happened to the kingdom saints that sold all that they had? Well, they would have sold all that they had. They would have had all things in common. And what events would have shortly followed? Jacob's trouble. So, look with me, if you would, get Revelation chapter 12. Now, the next quote in this question was, I find it hard to believe God stopped taking care of them. Well, the answer is, God didn't stop taking care of them. He just didn't provide for them in the manner that was prophesied. So, look with me at Revelation 12, verse 6. Revelation 12, 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. In other words, three and a half years. God's plan for the believing remnant, they were going to sell all that they had. They were going to have all things in common. And they were going to be able to sustain themselves up to what event? The abomination of desolation. Right? The midpoint of the 70th week. At the point the abomination of desolation is set up, what were they supposed to do? They're going to flee... And what Revelation 12, 6 says, that they should feed her there. Was God going to provide for them? Of course he was. And by the way, this is just an example of the brilliance of God. God gives the little flock, the believing remnant, the understanding, sell all that you have and give alms, have all things in common, because guess what's going to happen? When the 70th week starts, at the midpoint of the week, you're not going to be able to buy or sell anyway. So all the stuff you think you have, it's not going to do you any good, right? And if you own a, a big house at that point, how much value is it to you? When you jump off the housetop and flee into the wilderness, you're going to take the house with you? See, God's design was perfect, the way that God was going to provide for the kingdom saints is when they have all things common, that will get them up through the middle of the 70th week. And once you're at the middle of the 70th week, that's when the mark is going to be imposed. What do you need to do? You flee into the wilderness, and there God would miraculously provide for them. Get with me Galatians chapter 2. So here's what God did. Get with me Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. So this is the Acts 15 Jerusalem conference. Verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen, and they under the circumcision. Now notice verse 10. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. So what happens in Acts 15 is when the kingdom church gives the right hand of fellowship to Paul, they tell him that the body of Christ should remember the poor, the poor saints in Jerusalem. In other words, here's what happened. The saints in Jerusalem who believed, they sold all that they had, and that would sustain them for a time. But when God put the prophetic program on hold, and they didn't have to flee to the wilderness, they're still in Jerusalem, but they ran out of money because they sold all that they had. So God didn't stop providing for them what he did is he then said, body of Christ, you now have an obligation to provide for the poor saints at Jerusalem. Let me show you. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 25. 
Romans chapter 15 and verse 25. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. Well, he's ministering unto the saints where? In Jerusalem. The saints in Jerusalem belong to which church? It's the kingdom church. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are Jerusalem. Again, that's the kingdom saints. Now, notice verse 27. This is a beautiful verse. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. So let me comment on this beautiful verse. If you're in early Acts as a Gentile, how much hope do you have? The correct answer is zero, according to Ephesians 2. God interrupts the prophetic program. He calls time out. He institutes the dispensation of grace. During the dispensation of grace, do Gentiles have direct access to God? Are they made partakers of spiritual things that formerly belonged only to Israel? Yes, they are. So every Gentile on earth that has any sense, and certainly any, every saved Gentile should say, this is fantastic. The dispensation of grace gives us direct access to the true God that we never had in time past. With the creation of the dispensation of grace, the believing Jewish church was harmed in the sense that the miraculous provision that God was going to provide for them was no longer available. So what did the Gentiles have a duty to do? Because the Gentiles had been blessed with their spiritual things, they had a duty to minister unto them in carnal things. That's exactly what's going on. And every member of the body of Christ should say, happy to do it. You mean I just give some money? That something as simple as that in gratitude for the spiritual blessings I've obtained? Hallelujah. That's, that's done, right? A every person who is not ungrateful should think about it that way. That's what's going on there. That's why Paul was taking the, the collection up. It was because there were poor saints at Jerusalem that were members of the kingdom church that were aggrieved, that were harmed when the kingdom program was put on hold by the interruption of the dispensation of grace. So the next quote here, if he did stop taking care of them, why would they sell all they have during the tribulation based on this? The premise is false. God didn't stop taking care of them. What happened is he stopped taking care of them under the kingdom program. He took care of them in the dispensation of grace because in Acts 15, Peter and the twelve say to Paul, remember the poor, and Paul says, absolutely. God didn't stop taking care of them. He took care of them in a different way than was prophesied. Next statement here is, who knows if there is another interruption in the program, another mystery? So the, the, what the person is saying there is, what if there is another secret time period that, that God's going to insert? Give with me Colossians 1.25. I will share with you my view. You can obviously decide for yourself. But it is highly doubtful that there is another hidden dispensation. I don't think there is. And the reason why... Look at me at Colossians 1.25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. So the dispensation of God was given to Paul. For what purpose? To fulfill the word of God. So it is the dispensation of God given to Paul that does what? It fulfills the word of God. So I don't think that there is some other mystery dispensation that, that's going to be revealed. The, the next quote was, do we really know for sure that Paul wasn't concerned about all poor churches and not specifically the kingdom saints who sold all they had? Well, when we were in Romans 15, 26, it was the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. And it's those 
that uh, the Gentiles had a duty to minister unto them whose spiritual things they had received. So it's, it's clearly a reference to the kingdom church. Next question. In Acts chapter 9, people are still being saved into the kingdom. If prophecy and mystery can't exist at the same time, was Paul initially saved into the little flock? I understand Paul is the first saved into the body of Christ. When did that occur, and when did the dispensation of the dispensation change? Well, let's start with this. The person asked, if prophecy and mystery can't exist at the same time, the prophetic program and the mystery program do exist at the same time during the book of Acts. So if you look at the chart, when you look at the fall of Israel, after the fall of Israel, what is the, the next thing that you see? It's the diminishing. Does the diminishing sound like it happens in an instant or that it takes time? I mean, the concept of diminishing is gradual. So does the kingdom program disappear in an instant and it's just gone? Or does it... It diminishes. That's what it does. During the Acts period, Paul preaches the dispensation of grace, and the twelve preach the kingdom gospel, the kingdom message. Paul was not saved into the little flock. He was the first member of the body of Christ. Get with me 1 Timothy 1.16. Let's look at 1 Timothy 1.16, and then I'm going to ask you a question. 1 Timothy 1.16. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So the first question is this. Who is the first member of the body of Christ? Paul. Me first? It's pretty clear that Paul is the first member of the body of Christ. So here's the follow-up question. You're going to need to put two and two together. If Paul is the first member of the body of Christ, when did the body of Christ start? Acts 9. The, if Paul's the first member of the body of Christ, the body of Christ started when Paul got saved. So, not a difficult question, is it? The body of Christ began in Acts chapter 9. So, the dispensation of grace begins in Acts chapter 9, and the Acts period is a time when the dispensation of grace and the kingdom program are both taught while the kingdom program does what? It diminishes. It doesn't disappear in a moment. After the end of the Acts period, can anyone get into the kingdom church? So let's say you're alive today, and you read the Gospels, and you read Paul's epistles, and you say, well, I'm looking at both, and you know, I, just, I guess I'd rather be in the kingdom church. Can you do that? No, because what happened to the kingdom program? It, it diminished, and it went to nothing. It died out. So by the time you get to the end of the Acts period, the dispensation of grace alone is in effect. This next question is about Acts 16. And uh, get with me, Acts 16, verse 31. The question is this. How is it that the jailer's family would get saved? I guess I thought getting saved was a personal decision. So look with me. Let's look at Acts 16, verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, What do I need to do to be saved? Verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And so some look at the and thy house, and they say, well, wait a minute. Just because the Philippian jailer believed, how does that cause his whole house to be saved? Well, look with me 
well, let's do it this way. What Paul is saying is that the gospel invitation was available not only to the Philippian jailer, but his whole house. He wasn't saying, can you, can you go to the, the father of the house and say, look, if you believe the gospel, you'll get saved and everyone else in your house will get saved. That doesn't make any sense, right? Don't, doesn't everyone individually give account of themselves to God? That's the way that it works. Look with me at, go up to Acts 16.25 for a minute. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. Now notice this. And to all that were in his house. So who did they speak it to? To the jailer and to his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set me before them and rejoiced. Now notice this part. Believing in God with all his house. So what is the reason that his entire house got saved? Well, the word was preached unto them, and they believed. So the way to understand Acts 16.31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house... It's an invitation that is available to the entire house, and if they believe it, they will get saved. Now, here's one other thing I'll add just for fun. Get 1 Corinthians 13, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. So was Paul a prophet? He had to have been because he prophesied. So if you don't like the explanation I've given you about Acts 16.31, that what it's saying is that Paul and Silas were going to preach the gospel to his entire house, and the invitation was available to everyone who believed, and if they believed, they would be saved. If he was saying, thou shalt be saved and thy house, if he was doing it in that instance, he was doing it because what was he? A prophet, and God had revealed to him what would happen. So you, that's the other alternative way to look at it. But just to be clear before we move on, every individual person gives account of themselves to God. If you believe the gospel or don't believe the gospel, it doesn't affect anyone else's salvation, right? I mean, that, that, that much is obvious. Next question. Is there a specific event that will signify the end of the dispensation of grace, such as the stoning of Stephen or the collective Jews rejecting... I'm going to... Let me reread that. Is there a specific event that will signify the end of the dispensation of grace, such as the stoning of Stephen and the collective Jews rejecting the Messiah ushered in the age of grace? Will there be a specific event that causes the dispensations to change back to prophecy? So let me ask you this. What is the last event of the dispensation of grace? The rapture. So when the rapture happens, the, the timeline on the earth reverts back to the prophetic program. So that is the, the end, that is the event that marks the culmination of the dispensation of grace on earth. Are there precursor signs that the rapture is coming? Get with me 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. This know also, 
that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So are there precursor signs that the rapture is coming? Well, there are in the sense that 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 7, describe the spiritual conditions that exist prior to the rapture. But it's not quite the same as this. During the 70th week, how does the little flock know when they are to flee into the mountains? Armies compass Jerusalem, uh, Luke 21. The abomination of desolation is set up in Matthew 24, 15. When the abomination of desolation is set up, is that pretty clear and obvious? It's very clear and obvious because the beast goes into the temple and declares himself to be God, and it's just more than obvious, okay, that's, that's what the abomination of desolation is. It's time to flee. The dispensation of grace doesn't have anything that you know, visibly specific, right? It doesn't have any event like that. What it has is, is when you get to the end of the dispensation of grace, there are perilous times, and the reason there are perilous times is what happens to the spiritual character of man. It just degenerates as, as is described in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Men shall be lovers of their own selves and all those characteristics that are described in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Next question. Verses like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 and Romans 11, 6 demonstrate that man is not justified by a combination of grace and works during the dispensation of grace. How then does the kingdom gospel compare to Paul's gospel? Verses such as John 6, 29 seem to indicate that the only work needed is belief. Is faith only the entry point of salvation in the kingdom gospel, which must be maintained by works? 1 Peter 1, verses 4 and 5, seems to indicate that the Jewish believer to whom, Paul, uh, to whom Peter addressed could be assured that their salvation was secure because they were kept not by works, but by the power of God through faith. Would having two standards, faith only versus faith plus works, be a violation of God's law regarding unequal weights and measures? Would combining grace and works in the kingdom gospel be illogical? Okay, there's a lot in there. Let's go to John 6, 29. John chapter 6, verse 29. John chapter 6, verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Now, just to be clear, that verse doesn't say that faith alone is required under the kingdom gospel. Look with me at Mark 16, 16. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Under the kingdom gospel, is water baptism required as an expression of faith? And the answer is Yes. So let me summarize it this way. Everyone who has ever been saved and ever will be saved is saved on the basis of the Lord Jesus Christ shed blood. The only way that anyone's sins were ever fully dealt with 
was by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So anyone who, who has ever been saved or ever will be saved is saved on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Anyone who has ever been saved or ever will be saved is saved on the basis of grace. There's no one that earned it, right? Anyone who, have, who has ever been saved or ever will be saved is saved on the basis of faith. Without faith, it is what? It is impossible to please Him. So let's, let's pull this all together. Everyone that's ever saved, the basis is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Everyone who's ever saved is saved on the basis of grace. Everyone who's ever saved is saved by the basis of faith. But the content of that faith can be different. Did Noah believe Paul's gospel? No, he didn't. Now, he was saved by the shed blood of Christ. He didn't really know about that. He knew about that a little bit from Genesis 3, but certainly not as much as we would know. He was saved by grace. He was saved by faith. But how did Moses manifest that faith? Could Moses have done this? Could Moses have said, God, I believe your word to me, but I don't feel led to build an ark. If he had done that, his works would have revealed an absence of faith. If God says, I'm flooding the earth, you have to build an ark to survive, and you say, I'm not interested, you don't have faith. You just don't. What is unique about the dispensation of grace is that our faith is manifested apart from works. Most places on the timeline, faith is manifested by doing works. It's not that the works save. It's that the works make faith perfect. Look with me. At Romans 3.28. Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Have you ever talked to anyone who says, well, you're saved by grace through faith, but I think it's a good idea to get baptized. You're saved by grace through faith, but... You need to keep the law. Romans 3.28 says that you're saved. Now notice this. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Let me say it this way. If what you trusted for your salvation is Jesus Christ shed blood and something else you did, you did not believe the correct gospel. The correct gospel today is faith without the deeds of the law, without any other works. I've had people answer the question, if you were to die tonight and God said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And many will say, I've been water baptized. Well, that's not the right answer. Now, maybe you believed the correct answer at a moment in time. And if you believe the correct answer at a moment in time, you're saved, even if all your subsequent answers are wrong. But if, all, if what you always trusted, if what you always trusted for your salvation was your water baptism, that's not the right gospel. Look with me at James 2.22. Part of the simplicity of the dispensation of grace is that you are justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Compare that to James 2.22. Seest how faith wrought with his works. Now notice this. And by works was faith made perfect. James 2.22 doesn't teach salvation by works. What James 2.22 teaches is it's saying that if God's instruction to someone is to perform works, they have to perform those works to make their faith perfect 
It's not that their works were perfect. And the proof of that is they offered animal sacrifices. You don't need to offer an animal sacrifice if your works are perfect. Yes? Do you need to bring a sin offering if you don't sin? You see the point? God, under the Old Testament law, was not expecting them. I mean, he was, it would have been better if they avoided all sin. But he created the sacrifices for a reason. Did he know good and well that they were going to sin? Of course he did. It's not that their works made them perfect. It was that their works made their faith perfect. Now read the next verse, James 2.23. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. What really saved Abraham? His faith. But at times on the timeline, faith is made perfect through works. That's what James 2.22 says. So I'll say it one more time. Everyone throughout time, they're all saved on the basis of Jesus Christ's shed blood. There's nothing else that can pay for your sins. Everyone throughout time is saved by grace because no one ever earned it by their works. Everyone throughout time is saved by faith because without faith it is impossible to please Him. But the content of the faith differs. And whether the faith is faith alone, Romans 3.28, or faith made perfect by works, differs. Amen? Let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its perfection. We thank you, Lord, for what Jesus Christ did in shedding his blood for our sins. We thank you that he made the perfect and sufficient payment. We thank you, Lord, that you save us by grace because we could never be saved by our own works. We thank you, Lord, that salvation is available through faith. We just rejoice in the position you've given us in the body of Christ. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.